Good morning. All right, well, this morning, um, we continue in our series as we study the book of Titus. The title of our series is A Faithful Presence, and today we're looking at Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, just the first half of of verse 5, where we discover that we are changed by mercy. That's the title of the sermon this morning changed by mercy and we're picking right up where Tim left off last week when he taught us the first two verses of Titus chapter 3 and last week we saw how Christians are to be a faithful presence within our culture the best citizens of the city so to speak right and he outlined how we're to respect and serve others and guard our mouths against gossip and slander pursuing peace over personal pride, all while risking a life filled with acts of kindness and generosity as we live in a culture that, is bec- that seems to be becoming increasingly harsh. Now, this sounds wonderful, right, that, that there would be an opportunity for people to be like this, and why wouldn't everybody want to be like this? But it starts to beg the question, how exactly do I pull this new life off? How do, I, how do I do that? How do I become that? Do I keep just trying harder and harder, putting more and more effort into it? Well, today we consider the reality that we cannot pull this off on our own. We need help. We need God's mercy. If we're going to be a faithful presence and bring change for Christ in culture, then we must remember how and why God first changed us. If we want to be a faithful presence in our families, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, we must first recognize and celebrate God's faithful presence in us. And if you're a Christian today, we will remember and rejoice that we are saved by God's grace. And maybe today, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus for salvation and for renewal of your life, then this is a good opportunity for you to hear today that God's mercy is available for you. And so please, let's pray as we open the word of God and as we begin our time of teaching. Join me, please. Father, we thank you for your incredible love and your incredible mercy, your incredible grace for us. We pray this morning now as we turn to your word and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to cause us, cause our hearts and our minds and our lives to be submitted to your word, that you would open the eyes of our hearts so that we could see you so that we could discover your mercy, so that we could receive the free gift of grace in Jesus Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in 1940, the British and German Navy were engaged in their favorite pastime of trying to sink each other's ships. This is World War II. And in one particular battle, naval battle, The odds were grossly stacked against the British. Okay, get this. There was one British ship, and it was their smallest class of destroyer, and perfectly named in this crazy against-all-odds underdog story. This destroyer's name is the HMS Glowworm, okay? HMS Glowworm goes up against the Nazi heavy cruiser, the Hipper. The Hipper is three times the size and way more than three times the The armament. And despite this disparity in size and armament, uh, the British uh, captain of the ship decides that that would be a wonderful trophy to have on my mantle above my fireplace. Let's go after that massive ship. And he does. He immediately fires all of his torpedoes at the hipper, and they have no effect because every torpedo missed. So now he's left within range, and they're taking heavy fire. The ship is, is belching black smoke. And the, the captain of the glower makes the decision. He could either take off, and he probably has a couple knots on this big ship. He'd be able to maybe get away if he were able to maneuver and not get hit too many more times. Or he could turn his boat, go full speed, and just ram the side of this much larger ship. And I wouldn't be telling the story if he ran away. So he decides. 
And there's this amazing picture taken, or a couple of pictures actually, taken from the deck of the German boat of this little destroyer belching smoke coming right at them, right? And they successfully ram the side of this heavy cruiser, the glowworm blazing on fire as it rams into the ship, heavily damaging the Nazi ship's hull. Sadly, immediately it sinks the glowworm. The captain of the ship and all but 31 men perish. They die immediately. This leaves 31 floating survivors in the water, right next to the ship that they had just been shooting at and that they had just rammed. And so you'd think that the heartless enemy would be like, dude, those are the guys, right? Like, just shoot them or leave them. But that's not what happens in this story. The hipper rescues, the, the German ship rescues the survivors. Now, keep in mind, the Nazis were risking their lives to rescue these men. Certainly that position was radioed by the British, right? So they, they stick around, they pick up the survivors. This is an act of mercy. And once on board, the British POWs are shocked by the wonderful treatment that they are receiving. And even more shocking, the German commander of the ship comes to see the sailors and offers his compliments, telling them that he and his fellow officers couldn't, they just like, couldn't believe the fight that they just had. He had tremendous respect for them. Afterward, the German captain writes a letter to the Royal Navy, okay? Just picture that for a second. The German captain of this ship writes a letter to the Royal Navy, retells the story of what happened, and he makes a recommendation that the dead British commander be awarded the Victoria Cross. Okay, the Victoria Cross is the British equivalent of our uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. It's uh, pretty much the highest award anyone could get in the military, especially. And this honorable act of respect ended up getting that British commander a Victoria Cross. It's a tremendous honor for his family after the war. It's the first time that that award has ever been awarded based on the recommendation from the enemy. <laughs> but see, we have this story of one man showing mercy, honoring the family of a dead captain, even though he was an adversary in life, showing mercy to 31 men. All 31 of those sailors who were pulled from the sea survived the war. Our passage today reveals the truths about God's mercy that we must see and understand. And just as these British sailors' only hope of survival was for Germans to show them mercy, even though they definitely did not deserve mercy, so are we all, each one of us, desperate and living in desperate need for the mercy of God. And this, this morning, is our first point. We see the Apostle Paul laying out our need for mercy. Take a look at verse 3, Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Paul says, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Like a sailor thrown from his sinking ship into the sea, Paul is saying, we all, every one of us, each one of us, needs Mercy. Mercy is typically defined as the compassionate treatment of those in distress, especially when it is within one's power to punish or harm them. And so the word mercy derives from the root words, which would literally could be translated price paid. So it has this connotation of forbearance and benevolence and, and even like a, a hint of, kind, of, of kindness in there. And so in order for us to see our own need for mercy, we must first come to the point of seeing our own desperation in our lives apart from God. We are in need of God's mercy. We are in need of God's forbearance and benevolence. Apart from God's kindness, we are stuck like a sailor in a life jacket in the sea. In the previous two verses, which were taught last week, Paul distinguishes our former lives without Jesus from our new lives in Christ. And he does that by outlining our new life in Christ, telling us what this new life is life and like. And Paul says that we are now different. We have changed. And today he explains that this change, this difference in us, is all because of God's mercy. And he says in verse 3 that we were once just just to remind you again, we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, is what he said. 
What he's saying there is we were once wrongly ruled. Now, the wording here implies that we were led by the wrong ruler. We were, we were, instead of submitting to proper authorities and the proper rule for our life, we were at one time enslaved by passions. And many of us remember what it was like to be ruled by our own passions, to be ruled by pleasure, to be ruled by fear. And this memory is what fuels Paul's passion to teach others that life with Jesus is completely separate. It's entirely distinct from the wrong rule of our passion and our pleasures. It's important to remember that our lives were once governed by what is foolish, according to what Paul says here. We were living without understanding. And it's also important to remember when we were not directed by God's wisdom. We need to remember when we were deceived, literally being led astray by false leaders. And the word foolish and deceived that Paul uses here, they both carry with them this idea that we had the wrong understanding. That we, we just, we couldn't understand what was happening around us. And the, the two words mean two different things, right? Fo- we were foolish. It, it identifies this wrong in our life as a consequence of our own limitations. The second word he uses, deceived, right? This blames the wrong upon the effects of others. So in this state, we didn't possess wisdom. We were resisting God's wisdom. And we were believing and obeying lies told by others. We were believing uh, Wisdom that was not true wisdom. And this is the state of one's life apart from God's mercy. And this is the state of our culture apart from God's mercy. And this is a hopeless state, isn't it? And when we're honest, I think we all recognize our helplessness and our need for God's mercy. Many of us have pursued paths that the world promotes as wise only to discover that we'd been led to emptiness and disappointment. And so as we follow Jesus as Christians now, it's good to remember this so we don't return to such deceptive wisdom, right? The Bible calls that worldly wisdom, wisdom that seems wise, but in actuality it is not wise. And for Christians, the same old temptations that once led us, they still remain around us, right? Even as we endeavor to follow Jesus. And so Paul reminds us from where we have been delivered so that we might remain very careful in life, very carefully committed now to the new path of following Jesus. A pastor and theologian, John Stott, wrote the following uh, kind of words of commentary on this passage. He says this, the only reason that we dare instruct others in social ethics is that we know what we were once like ourselves. But God nevertheless saved us and that he can therefore transform other people too. It's not enough to affirm that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We must also be able to say that he has saved us. Even he has saved me. It's not just history which raises our expectations. It is experience. Without a personal experience of salvation, we lack the right We lack the incentive and we lack the confidence to teach social ethics to others, John Stott says. See, keeping our focus on Jesus reminds us that we are who we are only by God's grace. Keeping our focus on Jesus reminds us that we need to live in the mercy of God every day. And this mercy is not limited to just helping, make, helping us make better choices in life. God's mercy is also necessary to change our relationships, to, re- to redeem the way we relate to one another. Remember, that's also a part of verse 3. Look at Titus 3.3. 3. He said, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another's. Right? One another. That's not plural. Hating one another. Right? That's a, that's a nasty verse, right? There's a lot of words in there that you don't want in your life or in your relationships. But Paul is reminding us that we used to be motivated by revenge and retribution and envy. Without God's mercy, we strive to repay evil with evil. Revenge, right? That's what malice is. I recently watched the first John Wick movie for the first time with, with my 18-year-old. The whole premise of that movie is revenge, right? You killed the puppy that my wife gave me. Therefore, I will murder 110 people in the next 110 minutes, right? I just spoiled the entire movie for you. No mercy, 
And see, without God's mercy, we strive to repay evil with evil. That's what malice is. Without God's love, we desire to get even because others have what we do not have. That's what envy is. See, this sort of um, self-oriented life, this self-oriented attitude that we are prone to in our flesh, it damages our relationships. This posture toward the world and toward others, it makes us hated by others. Nobody wants to be around a self-focused person. See, this attitude, it also causes us to hate others because other people are in the way of me getting what I want. And see, here's what's challenging for all of us today. These motives, they don't necessarily disappear when we become Christians, right? It can be quick and easy for us to fall back into conflict with one another, can it? Are there no married people here? It can be easy for us to fall into conflict with people, right? So Paul reminds us that the Christian life must be different from our past life. It's distinct in the way that we are ruled, right? We we now are ruled by wisdom and we relate to one another differently. We are ruled differently and we relate differently. And there's a caution here. We are challenged to examine whether we are living a life distinct from our former life or whether we have inadvertently or perhaps even willingly drifted back into a worldly pattern of thought and a worldly pattern of actions. And each one of us must remember or see our need for God's mercy or we will stay on a self-focused track. Paul is saying, man, focus on Jesus. Remember your need for Jesus That's how you get through a rocky marriage. That's how you get through the hard conversations. That's how you survive parenting without killing someone, right? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Each one of us needs to remember that. And Paul is encouraging us. But distinguishing the Christian's past and present is not Paul's only motive in this passage. He also wants to clearly communicate the source of mercy. And this is our second point this morning. We're taking a look at the source of mercy. And Paul points this out starting in verse 4. He says, When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. See, in last week's sermon, we were exhorted to live a new life of humility and um, service and even sacrifice. And we all probably understand this humility won't come simply by remembering our past, right? Just remembering the past isn't always beneficial for us. See, for example, remembering a hopeless past can produce despair in some people rather than humility. So we're we're not just always focusing on the past. Or some other people, when they remember the past, they give themselves too much credit for receiving the love of God. Like, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but I think it's probably because I'm smarter than other people. But I actually, when I was presented with the opportunity to become a Christian, because I'm probably better than other people, I was able to make that decision and actually become better than them because now I have Jesus, right? And so the result of looking back for some of us when we struggle with pride is that we become prideful. We we season our testimony with just enough self-help and self-focus to to kind of like, Jesus isn't the complete hero of the story. He needed a little bit of my help. I'm the Robin to Jesus' Batman, right? And so Paul clarifies that our rescue is 100% the work of another. Our willingness to submit to authorities and live peaceably with others depends on our understanding of our desperation apart from the mercy of God. And this is absolutely necessary for each one of us to understand. Every one of us is 100% desperate and dependent on God and his grace 100% of the time. When we talk about how we've gone from living in darkness to light, listen, it's God who gets all the credit for that. When we talk about how we're growing and how we're changing, look, it's God that's doing that. It, it's not like your commitment to being faithful to read all those books and you're like, oh, he reads his Bible more than I do, so he's better Christian than I. No, it's, it's 100% God's mercy in our life. When we talk about the peace and the wisdom and the hope and the joy that we have, all of that comes from God as a free gift. Every blessing we have in life is because of God's mercy, because Jesus was willing to sacrifice for us. And it's because of the perfectly obedient life and the perfectly sacrificial death of Jesus that God can now justly and rightly forgive us and treat us as righteous. And Paul emphasizes 
that we have a new standing. We do have a new identity. And it is 100% in Jesus. Right up to the moment, God saved us. We were lost and guilty and wrongly ruled. Right? You weren't just one step away from solving the Rubik's Cube so you peeked on you know, YouTube to figure the rest of it out. That's not the way salvation works. Salvation is 100% an act of God. But now as we put our faith in Christ and we walk in him, our standing is different than it once was. Through Jesus, our sins have been forgiven. Our relationship with God is now restored. Our foolishness, our deceptiveness, us living under deception, living under lies, living under a self-focus, living under addiction, living under passions, they can be forgiven, they can be healed, and we now, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, which we'll hear about next week, can be healed and restored and redeemed. A perfect righteousness has been credited to your account. God can now regard us and treat us as if we had never been foolishly deceived or rebellious. He now treats us as if we had been obedient all along. See, Jesus is the gift of God's mercy for you today. And Paul puts a real fine point on it in Romans 5. Listen to this. Romans 5, verse 6. He goes, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, Every, every person needs to hear this this morning. Jesus is God's mercy for you. When Jesus died, he took our sins with him into the grave, defeating the power of sin. But he didn't just die. He also rose from the grave and leads us now into a new life without the burden and the shame and the brokenness of a life lived in slavery to sin. Jesus is a God's mercy. Jesus is your hope. He is your freedom. He is our new life. And this is the new life that Paul is talking about here. And this is a storyline that goes all the way back to the beginning of, of even the book of Genesis. You see a picture of God walking with humanity in the garden. And then in Genesis chapter 5, even after the sin, even after the fall, you see a man who walks with God, right? That's like literally the language that's used when um, Enoch is described in Genesis 5, 24. And here's the deal. The same can now be said of any person, every person, who trusts Jesus for their salvation, who confesses and receives forgiveness of sins and follows Christ. You can walk through life with God. God gives, gives you a brand new beginning. He gives you a brand new standing. God brings us into a very close relationship with himself. See, Jesus is the source of mercy that God extends toward us in order to rescue us from our hopeless place. And the fruit of this is that we are given and set free, and we now walk with God. Um, motivational speaker and author of like productivity and motivation books, Stephen Covey, he's, he's, he's coined this phrase, and I typically detest stuff like this, but this was interesting. He said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, right? I hate that kind of thing, but it it's, it's, makes a lot of sense which is why I'm telling you about it right now. Okay, the idea here in this catchphrase is that keeping our focus and our efforts on what is most important will help us accomplish our goals. Right, if you want to accomplish the right goal, you keep the right goal in front of you. And for us to understand and daily walk in God's mercy continually, what Paul is saying in our passage today is we need to keep the main thing in front of us. We need to remember the mercy of God. We need to remember that the credit for the fruit and the credit for the blessings and the credit for all the good things we got going for us and the hope that we have in life, it's 100% the credit for that belongs to God. God deserves the credit for our rescue. God deserves the credit for the blessings we receive. Our salvation is not a result of us earning God's favor. We have earned nothing from God. Rather, verse 3 reminds us that we were foolish and disobedient apart from God. And then it says in verse 4, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not 
because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. The kindness of God is the source of our salvation. The kindness of God is the source and the power behind our new life with Jesus. Our salvation is a consequence of what's in God's heart. Our salvation is not a consequence of what is in our heart. And listen, our new life with Jesus and our sanctification growing in Christ is not a consequence of what is in our heart. It is a consequence of what is in God's heart. God loves you and desires relationship with you. Therefore, it is in his heart and in his will for us to walk with him as children. And so here's the question that if you're really thinking about this, like I'm just like, why would anyone do that? I remember who I was. I don't have this gnarly, drug-riddled, you know, gangster, whatever, testimony. I have the testimony of a, of a very prideful, deceptively prideful person. I remember distinctly who I was before the power of the Holy Spirit transformed my life by the grace of God. So why would God want to rescue someone like me? It leads us to the final point of our message today, revealed in our passage. It's that the Apostle Paul shows us the reason for mercy. We need to understand the reason for God's mercy. Now, many of us know that God's mercy is not a reward for anything good that we've done, right? But I think some of us have a tendency to fall back into that sort of uh, thinking. Here's an example. We must not think of God's mercy like we think of the mercy that we tend to show our own kids. Okay, picture this. For those of you with kids, not going to be difficult for you to picture this. Okay, you walk into the house, and there are toys everywhere, okay? Literally everywhere. I don't know if you know my 8-year-old Shem. Toys everywhere, okay? You couple that with my 10-year-old Eden, and there's also clothes everywhere because he cha- she changes her outfit five times a day. That Things scattered all over every room in the house, including the hallway, the yard, all over Midtown, right? Those little uh, Nerf gun bullets. I mean, they, they reach probably into the east end and downtown, but they get, you know, the depth of them gets thicker as you approach the hospitals in North Brent. Like, like there's just stuff literally all over my neighbor, in my neighbor's yards, in their driveway, walking their cars, stuff everywhere. Now, I know Shem is not able to pick things up very well on his own, but I still ask him to do it, right? And so he goes out and he's just, you know, picking stuff up and complaining And when he has worked and he has struggled and he has absolutely suffered, he's got this massive nerve, he's dragging it on the ground, just trail of tears, like, oh, dad, I just, I can't, you know. Now, I'm the kind of person that would rather burn the house down than clean up a mess like that, but I'm like encouraging him, dude, good job, right? When he has finally struggled and suffered enough, given all of his effort and ability, finally I'm satisfied. And I'm like, good job, you may enter into your father's rest, right? Like, and... See, some of us think that's how God works. Like, that's how God acts with us. Right? Like, I'm not going to let the dog be happy enough in the living room because I still remember that he peed on the floor last night. And so I'm going to give her that look and she's going to kind of... St- like, like, God, like God somehow desires for us to sit under him in fear. Like, we make this effort to clean up our life. Like, we have to try super hard to keep God's commands in the hope that he will recognize us and deem us worthy of his mercy and his grace. Like we're supposed to go to the, you know, the 20-yard the line so that God can meet us there. See, that is not how God works. He doesn't take note of what we do and feel pleased with us and then reward us by doing the rest. He doesn't reward our good efforts to clean up our own messes. He's like, oh, okay, I'll extend some mercy to you. You've, you've earned it, right? No, it is not because of righteous things that we have done. The fact that we cannot earn our salvation strikes at the very heart of pride in us, which I think is why it can be so difficult for us to walk in God's grace. It's it's why it can be so difficult for us to extend God's grace. See, God's grace denies us the opportunity to exalt ourselves. And this is a point that the New Testament makes over. And I mean, the Apostle Paul hammers on this point, if you've ever read the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he puts it this way. He goes, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork. 
Okay, what he's saying, you did nothing, God did everything. Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians 2.16, he says, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So we too have put our faith in, our faith in Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And finally, a, a very familiar passage, Philippians 3, verse 9, he says, To gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, the mercy and grace that we have been given has not in any way been earned by us. If you're sitting there today thinking you're a bad Christian, listen, you're just like everybody else in desperate need for God's mercy. So why? Why has God moved to extend to us his mercy and his grace? Well, there's four words that really stand out in our passage that really reveal this. That those words are kindness, love, mercy, and grace. See, it was only when the kindness and the love of God appeared that he saved us. Kindness and love, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God's kindness and love. You want to know the kindness and love of God, you pursue Jesus. It was not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy, Paul says in verse 5. Well, what is the mercy of God? The mercy of God is Jesus. And then in verse 7, spoiler alert for next week, it says it was by his grace that he justified us. Again, he's talking about Jesus. Each of these words, they have their own distinct meaning, and they all point to Jesus. Remember that we came from a thoroughly hopeless and helpless state, foolish disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, Paul said. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. What he's saying is our lives were a train wreck. We couldn't make a good decision on our own. We, we, impossible. And furthermore, that affected our relationship, and we were now striving like one-upmanship in our personal relationships. And if you've ever tried to navigate a marriage apart from the grace of God, you know how absolutely horrifying that can be. What can I get for myself? How can I change this other person to be more like how I want them to be? It is a losing battle. See, our foolish and rebellious acts are the result of a sinful nature, the Bible teaches us. But here's the thing. Salvation can't be attained by just suppressing sinful acts, by, by just having the most self-discipline ever and just not doing bad things. Salvation from sin comes only when the source of sin is dealt with. And the Bible tells us we're born into sin, right? We're, we're sinful in our very nature. I, I don't remember teaching my kids how to sin, right? I didn't sit each one of my kids down when they were two and be like, all right, Here's how you become super jealous and mad on Christmas morning when your, you know, sibling gets something that you think is better than you. No, we we're born into that, right? We we're born with the ability to sin, and we were born with the desire to sin. And so the only way to deal with humanity's sinful nature is to be spiritually reborn. This is exactly what, jo what uh, Jesus talks about in John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And that metaphor, being born again, it speaks of the change that only God can accomplish in us. It's exactly what Paul is saying in verse 5 in our text today. He says, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Now, in the previous chapters up to this point, Paul has been describing the good things that Christians are to do, the way we now live. And he's describing this new good behavior and this new way that we sacrificially live in our relationships. See, the good works that Paul has been talking about in, in these previous passages, they are the result of our salvation. They are not the cause of our salvation. It's an important distinction for us to see. We are not saved because of our good works. We are saved for good works. Good works are the result, not the cause of the saving. It is the transforming power of God's grace that saves us and enables us to do the good things that Paul has been describing. Good works have no power to save us or to change us. Charles Spurgeon uh, put it this way. He said, Works of righteousness are the fruit of salvation, and the root must come before the fruit. 
I love that, right? It's like rap lyric back 150 years ago. The root must come before the fruit. The Lord saves his people out of clear, unmixed, undiluted love and mercy and grace and for no other reason. Listen, this morning, you can have the root of salvation established in your life. All of us long for the fruit of salvation. All of us long for restoration in our relationships. All of us wish we could be less self-focused. All of us wish that we could, our per- the hard edges, the sharp edges of our personality could be softened and we could just become instinctually a little less self-focused. We all long for that, but here's the thing. It, it, it's wrong for us to desire the fruit without first desiring the root, recognizing the root. And that's what Paul is getting us to do today. Man, we need help and it goes all the way down to the roots. God wants to meet you right where you are this morning with whatever you've got going on in your life. You might think you're too far away from God. You might think, well, man, I wasn't going to trade that. I was willing to go up to this point, but after that point, I'm like, I'd be too far gone. Some of us have traded beyond that point, and you're thinking I'm too far gone, gone for God. I made commitments to God in the past, and, and I've, I've broken every single one of them. You are not too far for God to rescue you today. You are not too far gone to, for God to restore you, to revive you. This morning, simply ask the Lord to show you your need for a Savior, to reveal the hopeless and helpless areas of your life that you are unable to change apart from his mercy. The Bible tells us that we have all rebelled against God and that we've earned our separation from God. Us living separately from God should be no surprise or shock to any of us. That's what we've earned. And this life separated from God is a life without purpose. It's a life without hope. It's a life without power. This separation from God is the result of sin, and we've all sinned. It's the result of our rebelliousness, but here's the good news. Even though we do not deserve help, just like that British ship had been shooting at and ramming the enemy, in the same way, we don't deserve for God to circle back around and pull us out of the water, but God does. He shows us mercy and offers us saving from a life separated from him. The good news is that God came down and lived a perfect life sinless life. And then he, Jesus, lays this perfect sinless life down as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin. God literally offers to exchange his perfect life where he has earned his relationship with the Father, exchanging it from us who have a train wreck of a history. God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and power are offered to you today as a free gift from God. And we all need God's mercy. Today, every one of us needs Jesus, the mercy of God, the source of God's mercy for us. And the reason for this, the purpose of God, God's saving and God's mercy is love. See, despite whatever we had to offer, which was nothing, God shows mercy and extends grace. We are the objects of God's love. And it is love that motivates God to save us. The Bible tells us that God is love. That's literally who he is. That's how he like, self-identifies. And God loves you and he wants to restore you to loving relationship with him. And he has done everything necessary. No matter how far out at sea you find yourself floating. No matter how many shots you've taken at him, so to speak. If you find yourself floating in the sea and you cry out, he will rescue you. He loves you and longs to restore your life with him. You can know the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God today. And so our charge and our challenge as we now enter our time of worship is to receive God's free gift of mercy. To receive the love of God. To ask for forgiveness. To let yourself be changed by mercy. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and I thank you God for this time we have today to come and to, to give ourselves to the truth, to give ourselves to a truthful understanding of who we are and where we find ourselves in life. And God, I'm so thankful that you have thrown us a rescue line, that you don't leave us where we deserve to be left, but you pull us out of our lives situations. You pull us out of the sea that we're drowning in I just want to pray, God, for us this morning that we would respond 
that as this truth kind of rattles around in our head, Lord, that you would allow it to sink into our hearts and that you would move, that you would show us the areas in our life, the patterns that we have in our minds, in our hearts, in our relationships that need to be surrendered to you, that need saving. We invite you now, Holy Spirit, to come and lead us to Jesus where we find salvation. Lead us to Jesus where we find forgiveness, where we find hope. And some of us today for the first time need to reach out and say, Lord, save me. Others of us today, Holy Spirit, you're convicting us possibly in our relationships, maybe in our self-focus. I pray, God, that we would respond, say, Lord, I need your mercy. Please forgive me. So as we respond in worship now, we celebrate, we rejoice, and we respond by laying hold of the mercy, by laying hold of Jesus this morning, in whose name we pray. Amen.